We're going to begin section two, the muscular system, by discussing the neuromuscular junction. The neuromuscular junction, we're going to divide into four parts. First, let's talk about the basic structure of the neuromuscular junction, and then we'll talk about the transmission as the impulse continues across from the neuron to the muscle, and then how the transmission ends, and then different diseases or chemicals and drugs that alter the transmission across the neuromuscular junction. So let's begin with a little bit of microanatomy. When we get to the nervous system, we'll talk about the neuron in more detail. But for right now, you should know that a neuron is a nerve cell. Here we're going to look at the soma, which is a cell body where you find the nucleus and ribosomes and all that. And from that, you have the dendrites. The dendrites is where the impulse comes to the soma, traveling inside on it. And then extending from there, you have the axon. And the axon has different portions. It has the axon helic and then the initial segment where the action potential will begin. And then it makes its way down, propagates to the end, where we call the axon terminal or the boutons. I kind of like that word, boutons. They're just like, you know, little booties at the end there just that they put on. So axon terminal or bouton. All right, so a junction you can also say is a synapse. It's pretty much like a joining where things come together. So we have here down at the bottom the synapse or the junction of the neuron and the skeletal muscle cell. Now if you notice before we continue you see the word myofiber. Well anytime you see myo you should also think of muscle and fiber here in this case would be cell. So you call it a muscle fiber, you call it myofiber and whatnot. All right, so let's zoom in down there at the junction. Okay, so here we are here at the junction, and let's label a couple components. We'll first start off on the axon terminal, or the bouton, and here we have a calcium voltage-gated channel. If you remember from chapter one, we talked about mechanical-gated, voltage-gated, and ligand-gated. This is voltage-gated. Then inside here, the bouton, we had synaptic vesicles. Vesicles are like little bubbles, if you remember. And inside these little bubbles, we have a neurotransmitter or a chemical. And that chemical is acetylcholine. It has two components, an acetate portion and a choline portion. That's why you see them in different colors. There are different neurotransmitters in the body, such as dopamine, noradrenaline, and whatnot that we'll talk about again in the nervous system. But here in the neuromuscular junction, what you need to know, the neurotransmitter, that is acetylcholine. Now as we make our way across this gap, we have the plasma membrane of the myofiber, which we call the sarcolemma. Now, just to draw your attention to this word sarco, you're going to see that four times. You're going to see sarcolemma, you're going to see sarcoplasma, sarcoplasmic reticulum, and sarcomere. This sarcolemma is the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. So don't confuse your sarcos as you see more of them later on. And then this gap, this space, we call the synaptic cleft, or just the synapse. So Anytime we say the word pre, it means before, so that's the presynaptic cell, is this motor neuron. It's a motor neuron because it innervates something that's going to move, like the skeletal muscle cell. And then after, we say the word post, like if you think of a game, a post-game report is after the game. And we call this the muscle end plate. It sometimes has its name because when you look down on it, it kind of looks like a plate and all the boutons on top of the muscle just looks like, I guess, you know, little peas. I guess I'm getting a little hungry here. All right, and then on the other side, you have a receptor for the neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. And very important to notice, this is a nicotinic receptor, because later on, we'll talk about muscarinic receptors when we get to the nervous system. Okay, so this is not muscarinic, it is nicotinic, and it allows sodium to pass through, sodium to go in. Also worthy of note is it also allows a little bit of potassium to go out, but there's a greater influx of sodium, so we'll be focusing on sodium. Let's continue by talking about transmission as it goes across this synapse. There is a series of five steps that we're going to walk through in more detail coming up here. I just listed them to begin with. We'll start with the action potential as it makes its way down the axon. And in these series of steps, we'll end as it reaches the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. All right, so the first step here, this thing here represents the action potential. 
and you're gonna see it as it propagates or moves down the axon as it makes its way down to the end or the terminal. So again, it starts up, propagates down to the axon terminal, step one. The next step is you're gonna see this uh, action potential reach, the voltage-gated calcium channel, and calcium will come in. We call this an influx of calcium. And again, it's opened by the voltage. So here it comes, the voltage reaches, hits the calcium channel, and there's an influx of calcium into the axon terminal. Why is this influx of calcium important? Is because it causes the exiting or the exocytosis of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. So again, calcium comes in and it causes the synaptic vesicles to leave. In terms of cell biology, this calcium interacts with the snare proteins on the vesicles causing the exocytosis of the neurotransmitter. The fourth step is this acetylcholine is going to travel to its receptor on the sarcolemma. Again, let's rewind that. So it's going to travel, and you notice there's two of them that bind. You need two to open, and causing an influx of sodium. Again, there is also an efflux of potassium, but it's minor, so the influx of sodium is a greater consideration. This influx of sodium will cause a depolarization. And we call this a miniature end plate potential. So one vesicle or one quantum of acetylcholine will cause a slight depolarization. And as you add them up and up, then you'll, you'll summate them to produce an end plate potential. And these end plate potentials will cause the surrounding sarcolemma to produce an action potential. And as you see, that blue spark right there continuing, representing the action potential and the change in the potentials across the membrane. Again, if we rewind back, you'll see it's negative on the inside, positive on the outside. When the channel opens and the sodium comes in, it will reverse the polarity. So positive on the inside and negative on the outside. Now, how does the transmission end? Okay, so we need to break down or we need to degrade the acetylcholine to its two components, the acetyl-CoA, the acetate, and choline by an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. So you see it comes there, binds to the enzyme, and it breaks up into two components. Again, it leaves the receptor, binds to the enzyme, the enzyme breaks it into its two components. What happens after that? Well, there's going to be a reuptake of choline. So choline will be transferred back into the axon terminal or the bouton and if you notice what's going to come along with it sodium is going to come along with it again so here it is sodium comes along with choline and it goes in through this transporter here this sodium choline transporter it's a type of secondary active transport if you remember secondary active transport well the sodium potassium pump that's primary active transport pumps sodium out so when it comes back in it pulls something with it which is choline and if you notice that it, this enzyme here, choline acetyltransferase, don't confuse it with acetylcholine esterase. All right, so this one, choline acetyltransferase, helps to combine and make new acetylcholine. All right, so here it comes, the choline back inside, and it will combine with another acetyl-CoA or acetate portion to make acetylcholine. And now for drugs that alter the transmission across the neuromuscular junction, and not just drugs, but diseases as well, too. So here's a table that helps us summarize some of these things. The first two here, these are diseases, myasthenia gravis and Lambert-Eaton syndrome. And then the four after that are drugs or chemicals. I list here the action. That's what's going to happen. For example, myasthenia gravis, you see they're both autoimmune, uh, including Lambert-Eaton syndrome. They're antibodies. One it goes against the acetylcholine receptors. The other one goes against the calcium, the voltage-gated one. And then what do they cause here? They both cause relaxation or pretty much muscle weakness. If you notice, most of them cause here muscle weakness or relaxation. I put a star next to succinylcholine uh, because both of these, curare and succinylcholine, both bind at the same place, the acetylcholine receptor. However, what we call curare, we call it a non-depolarizing uh, type of chemical that's going to relax the muscle and succinylcholine is a depolarizing relaxer because what happens is it first depolarizes which means it first causes contraction and then after that it causes relaxation 
versus curare, which is just block, so it causes immediate relaxation. And the way I help you to understand these here is going back to our diagram of the neuromuscular junction. We have the Lambert-Eaton syndrome right here, where it blocks the voltage-gated calcium channels. So calcium is not allowed to come in, which doesn't allow the vesicles to release, so you're not going to get a muscle contraction. In a kind of similar fashion, we have botulism toxin. You heard of Botox injections, which basically are relaxing those wrinkles on your face. So botulism toxin prevents the synaptic vesicles from being released. So if you can't release the neurotransmitter, you cannot have contraction. At the acetylcholine receptor, we have one disease. We have myasthenia gravis, and then we have those two uh, chemicals or drugs, curare and succinylcholine. And uh, succinylcholine, again, being used kind of for intubation. And uh, one thing to note is sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between somebody who's Lambert-Eaton syndrome or myasthenia gravis because they're both autoimmune. They both cause muscle weakness. One way to know clinically is that my, uh, sorry, um, Lambert, Lambert-Eaton syndrome gets better throughout the day where myasthenia gravis does not. Because throughout the day, you're sending more and more action potentials, which is causing a greater um, overactivation of these calcium channels, which will help you to get more release, as opposed to myasthenia gravis, where these channels are being blocked. However, or sorry, these receptors are being blocked. However, there is kind of a test or a partial, you know, treatment, so to say not a complete treatment, but just to help with symptoms symptomatically, and that's neostigmine. So, and it's, it's a way to tell if somebody has Lambert-Eaton or myasthenia gravis because neostigmine blocks the acetylcholine esterase enzyme, so that means you cannot degrade acetylcholine, so you keep more acetylcholine in the synapse. So if you have more acetylcholine because it's not being broken down, you can, it competes with the antibodies uh, produced by myasthenia gravis, it can help to open that channel. It won't work with Lambert-Eaton because the problem here is the, the calcium channel over here. Um, a mnemonic that kind of helps remember is when you eat, right? When you eat, you get better. So Lambert-Eaton gets better throughout the day. So that's kind of a little mnemonic to help you remember that. The last chemical here is hemicholinium, and hemicholinium blocks the sodium choline reuptake channel, also causing muscle weakness or relaxation.